Welcome to Filipino Comic Book Artistas from Pencil to Digital Panel at WonderCon at Home, presented by Search to Involve Filipino Americans. SIPA has been serving the community for 49 years with our youth and family-focused human and health, uh, community economic development, and creative arts and cultural services based in historic Filipino town, Los Angeles, California. My name is Quincy Victoria, and I'll be your host and moderator for this amazing panel at WonderCon at Home. And I'd like to introduce our multi-talented panelists. So please meet Mike Del Mundo. Mike Del Mundo is a Filipino-Canadian comic artist with the majority of his work coming from Marvel Comics. He is well known for his run on Thor with Jason Aaron and his many astounding covers, which include X-Men, Elektra, Spider-Man, and The Avengers. He recently created Al Mart for Alfredo by Freddie Gibbs and The Alchemist, which snatched the 2021 Grammy nomination for Best Rap Album. Mike is currently working on a new exciting project with Todd McFarlane on Spawn. Our next artist is Francis Manipal, and he is a New York Times bestseller and an award-winning artist and writer based in Toronto, Canada. Francis is best known for his work uh, relaunching The Flash for DC Comics' New 52 initiative and following it up with the company's namesake title, Detective Comics. He is currently the writer and artist for the DC Rebirth title Trinity, which stars Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. His past work includes Superman, Batman, Legion of Superheroes, Adventure Comics, accompanied by his pro prolific career as a cover artist. He's also worked for multiple publishers on titles such as Tomb Raider, Seth Guerrero, G.I. Joe, The Darkness, and Witchblade. Francis has also dabbled in the world of television as one of the main hosts on History Channel's Beast Legends, which combined globetrotting adventures and challenging art projects. And last but not least, our last artist here is Will Spertasio. Will Spertasio started as an inker on Alien Legion and Longshot in 1984 before launching his three decades career as a penciler. He has been a leading comic book talent ever since his big break on Marvel's, Marvel titles Punisher, X Factor and Uncanny X Men in the early 90s and created Bishop. Pertasio was also one of the seven founders of Image Comics. He created what works for Image and later released the independent, successful creator owned titled Stone with partner Brian Haberlin. Stone is based on Filipino mythology. Another creator owned book, Non Humans, was launched later with good friend and uh, good friend film and comic book writer Glenn Brunswick. Wills has worked on Marvel, DC, and image titles like X-Force, Hulk, Batman Confidential, Spawn, and still currently works for these companies, including the latest X-Men book, Major X. Welcome, everybody. Hey. Uh, hey. <laughs> How's everybody doing? We got we hanging in there? Good. Good. Can I also just compliment you real quick on uh. how closely you stuck to my bio? <laughs> <laughs> it also reminds me that I need to update it. <laughs> so so we did a panel last year um, uh, Francis and I and yeah. I totally murdered Seth Guerrero and, and it was funny because I took French for three years and I totally missed it <laughs> I missed the mark but I got it right this time so oh man okay so you guys ready for you guys ready to get into it sure let's go okay <laughs> so obviously we are all you know fellow Filipinos here and, and you know we, we, we like to kind of build off of each other. Uh, who were your Filipino, and this goes for all three of you, who were your Filipino influences in and maybe even outside of the comic book field and and outside of that, who were your non-Filipino uh, influences? Okay, let's, go, let's go, let's go Mike. All right, uh, <laughs> all right. as a kid, there's two guys. There's Will Spertesho. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta show you up, man. I'm a dude. You know that got me into it, especially the fact that he was Filipino, and um, that really meant a lot. So that that got me inspired, and then then there's Ernie Reyes Jr. and uh, oh yeah, so those are the two that from as a child that really you know inspired me as a Filipino artist. Um, and then do we go on? Yeah, what, what, how about outside of that? Where, like, any non Filipinos? Do you, do you have any non Filipino? Oh, okay. uh... Non Filipinos. Yeah. Um, and then, like, in terms of comics, mm -hmm. 
all, all the image dudes. So everyone that most was involved with like Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Rob, Mark Silvestri. Yeah. There's so many. And then from there, it's just, the list just goes on. Um, and then as, as the years pass by, uh, um, there's the, the next dude right there on that screen at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna name all the Filipino artists, and then I mean, him, Adrian Alfona, uh, Lionel Yu, uh, Jerome Pina, all those dudes. Mm -hmm. But so many of the name, man. But this is a little handful right there. Awesome. What about you, Francis? Oh, well, definitely that guy over there. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing now? Zoom back. Zoom back. There you go. That that. Guy. <laughs> the funny thing is, the first time I, I saw his work. I actually, Patricia for some reason came off as a, as an Italian name to me when I was younger. And then when I saw a photo of him, I was like, oh my God, you know? And, and it's funny because it actually does bring up a lot of importance to why representation matters these days. Because up until I saw Wills on, on those books, I, I just, for some reason, I just didn't make the connection that, that I could get to these kind of jobs. And then uh, once I took like a div a deep dive into comic books. I literally went to the library and I went to the letter C in, in the catalog. And there was this uh, book on comic book illustrators. And I saw the work of um, uh, Alcala and coaching. Yeah. And I had no idea that there was like this, this deep, rich history of Filipino illustrators who entered and kind of shaped this, this new look that was kind of entering the comic book market because before they entered in, it was kind of more simplified, but when they came in, they added such a, a rich, finer detail to it. It, it. And it's funny because it had this, this handcrafted feel. It, obviously it was all handcrafted, but the extra work in it just, you could feel it, right? And then from, from there, obviously just like Mike, I think we're basically the same age. So all of the image guys, um, but in terms of any major influence outside of, of comic books, it was actually watching the documentary Hoop Dreams. Um, mm -hmm. You well, yeah, because like you know, mm -hmm. essentially these kids who are trying to chase their dream to make their situation better, right? And obviously, I know that none of us here are going to be basketball players. Right? <laughs> <laughs> maybe Mike. Maybe Mike. Maybe Mike. Yeah, I had a dream, and I did have a dream about that. But yeah. Uh, then I realized, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hear senses. But, uh, no, it's just like, you know, like, we, we all came from, uh, or, you know, I came from a, an immigrant family to Canada, and it, it, it felt like um, if, you know, there, there's almost like this deep-rooted thing to try to make something of yourself with this opportunity that you have. And, you know, long and behold, like, comic books, you can literally live anywhere, but watching that documentary kind of lit this fire under my ass to essentially – if you wanted to to be something or get yourself out of a situation, you got to find that one thing you're good at, and if it's something that you also enjoy. So that's that documentary Hoop Dreams is, it played a major factor in in my comic book career, even though it has nothing to do with comics. Gotcha. So uh, what about what about non Filipinos outside of uh, uh, you know in comics, non Filipinos? What, what were your influences? Oof, honestly, there there was a lot. Um, obviously, all, all the image guys. But the, the one that, that really changed it, because a lot of my influence actually looked nothing like my work. Um, mm -hmm. Like Mike Mignola is a, a big oh, yeah. fan. Um, but one that really influenced me early on was uh, actually Mike, the, the late Mike Waringo. Um, mm -hmm. Before his work, I was trying to essentially emulate uh, certain, um, a certain look, right? And I, it didn't occur to me that I could really uh, create a greater connection with my work if I were to, to simplify because um, I think simplification of your work makes the, the art a little bit more, um, I guess, compatible because the more you simplify a person's face, the more relatable you can be to it because it's it's not so detailed that it's it's separate from you. So um, Mike Ringo's work was was really pivotal in making me feel like when I was reading those flash books, you know, it wasn't just like some white dude that he was drawing. It was just some dude whose face is really cartoony and he even had like round nose sometimes. And I was like, oh, well that, that could sort of be me, you know? And I think it's, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Wills. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm <clears throat> the oldest one here. So, <laughs> so my influence years was growing up in the time of no internet and stuff. 
So you could only be, you know, um, influenced by what you can get your hands on. So um, uh, my my dad retired from the Navy in the late 70s. So we went back to the Philippines. And um, I actually got to see some um, Filipino comics. And uh, the guy that, 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 you know, jumped out at me was um, Hal Santiago. He had this crisp line style. Um, but just like what Francis was saying, um, he was he, he he was simplified. He knew his forms. He knew um, exactly what he needed to draw. You know, not, not a lot of fluff to it, but just solid work. Um, and then when I went back to the states, um, the only um, stuff I could get uh, my hands on were there were these um, um, like cheap mag uh, um, printed magazine things um, of Alex Nino's work. So um, uh, if I saw among Alice's work, and I was just I was just floored because before that I grew up in Hawaii, so I had a lot of Japanese influence in me, and um, Alex was just like a, a, a Filipino synthesis of that, you know, and um, it, it 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 just hit me his design um, style and that his effortless, you know, just being able to do whatever, um, um, you know, came into his mind. You know, like, you know, my, my other influences outside were like Jack Kirby. And so I saw Alec, Mung Alex as, you know, like uh, the Filipino Jack Kirby, but um, with just a wilder imagination. And um, so I grew up with mostly American influences, but um, I think there's something about um, DNA, about our, our blood, um, because um, it, it, in my within my career, I was then be able to, like, meet up with um, um, Mung Tony De Zuniga and um, Sila Early Chan and everybody, and um, and then started networking out with um, you know Phil Cool guys, you know like Francis and Mike, um, you know trying to pull that network together because I grew up where everybody was, you know we didn't know, you know we, we thought Ernie Chan was Chinese, yeah we thought, thought Al Kala was Spanish or something, you know um, Francis is right a lot of people because of my first name thought I was Wilche. So I, I was French or Italian or something, you know, and so it was only later on that I was able to connect myself with with all these other guys. And uh, like I said, there's something about blood with me, because as you guys know, I'm, I, I've got kind of a dark style and, and I love shadows and I love framing. I, I love the film look. And you look at a lot of, you know, the guys that came the generation and the generation before me. And, you know, those guys are, you know, respected names, even in, you know, um, in the U.S. superhero market. And they have a lot of the same characteristics as I have. You know, the, 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 the darkness, the love of shadows, the love of, of framing, the love of detail, you know. So even though I didn't actively grow up with that influence, it, it, was, it was within me, you know, which I think is apropos, you know, for like what we're talking about. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Alex Nino. His, his stuff is amazing. I Like, I, I would watch videos of him just straight pen to paper, and it's just, he's so confident in his strokes. And, and yeah. like, it, it just, you know, it's like, all of a sudden, you got this amazing picture in front of you. And he, he, no, no erasing, no, like, he didn't think about it and then change something here. And there. Uh, so great stuff, man. Great stuff. All right. So, you know, being that we're, you know, we're, we're, showing this to uh, what I'm gathering uh, a bunch of Filipinos that probably want to get into the business. They, uh, like, I think the number one thing that they want to know is how did you guys get started in the business? Let's go ahead right around the table again. Let's start with Mike. Uh, well, just straight to comics. Um, just like how it was before when you just bring your portfolio to a comic convention and show off your portfolio. And that's pretty much how it happened. Like I brought my portfolio to Toronto uh, fan expo and showed it off and they actually uh, gave me a job right there so my story is pretty simple um, I don't know what else um, I could say um, there you go what, what kind of what kind of stuff did you have in your portfolio was it did you have pages did you have pencils what was what was going on there uh, it was pretty interesting um, I had like no comic work in my portfolio so that was kind of the difference when I showed it it was a Put together a hardcover book and i think i actually wowed them with the fact that it was not like a portfolio like with like plastic sheets it was like an actual done up book so i might have oh, wow. Wow. 
that way it was more professional looking. But yeah, there was just a lot of concept work, a lot of um, fan art for movies, stuff like that. And um, they liked what I did, I guess, the way I kind of approached things. And um, yeah, I got a job from there. Nice. Francis. Uh, I, I also printed a hardcover of my portfolio. Um, no, I, it's a photocopy and I, and I wrote down my address on every single page. Um, but I tell you the truth, I, I did not get any jobs from, from any of my submissions, but similar to Mike, I essentially went to these conventions and I essentially bugged the same editors over and over again. So I think from, from the time that I was about 16, that I started attending conventions. They, it was interesting because they, I guess they would kind of see me grow up over the years and every year i would just make samples of um it would be specific storytelling pages because uh at the time i was i was really i was really pragmatic about it i essentially looked at books that i thought i stylistically fit so i catered my portfolio around that so i the irony of it is that i actually have portfolio pieces for marvel because I, I drew a bunch of fantastic four samples and i drew a bunch of uh gen 13 samples but the two samples i actually never had was i i did not have any top cow or dc samples but um the the approach that i kind of took with my portfolio um is uh i kind of wanted to draw in the editors so the first i i kind of applied this three page uh formula that i did where essentially the first two pages are just normal things happening and you actually don't realize what sample from creating until the last page which was always a splash page of the heroes so the first two pages was kind of like the city or a person in danger up until you get to the last page and finally you get to see that it's fantastic four or it's gen 13 and i, and I felt that it, it kind of helped draw the editors along because they were kind of actively engaged in 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 reading so that way um i always felt that i was kind of a, st a stronger storyteller than than an illustrator so i kind of leaned heavily into the storytelling side and uh eventually you know, essentially somebody was laid on something and they needed somebody, something last minute. And uh, so yeah, con conventions. Sorry, awesome. that was a long way to answer it. And, and no, that's perfect. That answer even longer. Like this is probably a question we should answer later on, which is that's probably not how anybody's going to get in these days. <laughs> yeah. you know? So I figured, and, and, and of course you will. So how did you get started? Um, everything said above. <laughs> Um, I, too, went with a, a portfolio um, like Mike that had almost nothing to do with comics. Um, I was, uh, uh, I, I'm a heavy science fiction novel um, reader and, and, and heavy film guy. And so uh, the se only sequential artwork I had was like a Mad Max story. Um, and um, I had um, a big ink piece board of... Uh, of uh, the meeting at Elrond's table, um, and, and I drew my version of everybody there. So it was kind of like a Last Supper, but that was fully inked, fully rendered. Um, I had watercolor pages, but nowhere near like what Francis could do. My watercolor pages, um, and, and Francis should will probably um, giggle at this. My 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 watercolor pages look like acrylic or gouache. <laughs> So I knew nothing about watercolor. Well, it's funny. Clearly, I don't either because I've since moved on to gouache. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's funner. I mean, well, once you get that layer down there, right? Then then it's fun. But um, yeah. my portfolio didn't really have anything to do, but um, with really with comics, but it showed um, the full spectrum of of what I could do in, in with art. And um, I, I've been lucky my whole life, and, and I really believe that's a big factor um, because. That was my very, I, I was in San Diego. My dad retired from the Philippines and they, they let me after two years of college in the Philippines, they let me come back to the States. I came back to San Diego and my cousin said, hey, there's this thing called San Diego Comic Con. And he drags me over for my portfolio. And it just happened to be the year that Marvel sent every single one of their editors for a talent hunt. And uh, that's where I met Carl Potts. He brought me aboard, and uh, the great thing about Carl, he was one of the senior editors, but he actually believed in talent. And so instead of every, all of you guys probably are familiar with this, you know, you, you, your your portfolio is not good enough yet. 
but they say, yeah, your portfolio is real good. You know, you should come back next year. Carl would say, your portfolio is real good. Give me your number. And like every two weeks, he would bug you for more, um, for more work. And then um, I was lucky that it, within a couple of weeks, he then sent me um, Xerox copies of a book called The Five Seas of Cinematography. And that's where I learned storytelling, you know. Um, so, I, I, you know, I am kind of the same story as everybody else, everybody, uh, you know, getting in um, uh, through a comic convention. Um, me, just by chance, I didn't know what this thing was about. I mean, this was way back in the Jurassic period, you know, the, the early 80s. And um, and just started from there, just doing whatever um, I could. And um, one thing, one tip for a lot of people: um, when Scott Williams and I came in, we we were we were buddies in high school, so we came in together, and we both could pencil and ink. And when you know how to do a couple of the disciplines, you get pushed up the um, the list, because anytime um, there's a penciling job that goes awry. They can call you in and also when an inking job comes in you know they could they can call you in and then like francis and both mike you know because they they they, they color and they paint too you know that puts them up a notch then too so the more you can show that you can do things the more you will get noticed in the beginning but but as both of them will probably know the the, the detracting side of that is then you get all these jobs where well the penciler inker and the colorist couldn't finish it and there's only a week left in the deadline. Can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and yep. that's what happened to me. I started getting all these FedEx boxes of, you know, uh, pages with a circle. Oh, this is Leonardo. <laughs> a circle. <laughs> you know, this is, you know. Um, but uh, it, it is one of the best ways to, um, to get noticed because um, that's the whole thing with um, any industry, just to get noticed. Once mm. you get noticed, then it's just, you know, it's just up to you. It's just up to you. Uh, the beginning, trying to get noticed, part of that's faith. But once you get that chance, if, if you're talented, if, if, if you really want to, if you really are willing to push, you know, then take that break and show them that, you know, you know, I don't care if you copy any, everything or anything that's popular at the time. Just get in. Because once you get in, then you can do the sink of it. You know, you know yeah. he started, his, you know, started in as Neil Adams. And then, you know, got new mutants and went, hey, I'm going to become Bill Sinkovich. And boom, blew everybody away and, you know, never looked back from there. But you got to get in. You got to get in. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. So Francis mentioned earlier, that, you know, after some digging, he, he started discovering, like, you know, Tony DiZaniga, Alfredo Alcala, like all these different Filipino artists. And it goes all the way back to the 70s, uh, maybe, maybe even the 60s. Why do you guys think... Uh, Filipinos have have enjoyed such a long tenure in, in the comic book field. Let's go uh, to, to all three of you. Like, why is there so many? Is that yeah, like, why are why are there so many, and why why are we still why are we still here? <laughs> well, I, I guess I could speak for myself in terms of I'm not I'm sure everyone else might have the same experiences, but I grew up in a family that was very into music, so they're already into the arts. And then, I don't know, I'm, I was trying to figure that out when I saw that question initially. And I was like, yeah, what is it? And I was like, well, I mean, we all share that whole karaoke vibe. And, like, that's pretty, like, you know, like, as, as it is delving into the arts in that sense, like, the openness, yeah. enjoying that. So I was like, yeah, that might that might be a theory, like, you know, like, just the idea that we um, we do embrace the arts in a sense. Yeah, I think... Uh... What is it? Um, we, we didn't come up with the phrase OA for nothing, you know? Like, I, I think, <laughs> there, I don't know, maybe there's, there's a natural um, inclination to entertain or, or whatever. But, I mean, if, if, if you're looking at it for, from a broader uh, question to an answer, I think it probably has to do with... Um, the Filipino culture's ability to be diligent workers. You know, I think that uh, growing up in in a country uh, like the Philippines and the different um, economical situations we may have all grown in, I think there's this um, kind of innate ability for for us to, in in some ways, um, not I'm not saying like uh, appreciate, but but more so 
to always strive. I think we're used to being fighters. And I think that this scrappy nature that we kind of grew up in um, gives us almost this edge because, you know, not, not to jump around topics, but I feel that in comic books, the most important thing you could have, it has less to do with skills and abilities and it has more to do with your tenacity. And, you know, growing up, how I grew up, the one thing that I wanted to accomplish with getting into comics was es essentially I didn't want to remain poor. And I thought comic books was a way for me to make that situation better. And it just so happens that it was something that uh, I was pretty good at. And it was something that I, I was passionate over. But when I entered into comics, it had more to do. It came more from, from the pragmatic end of my brain rather than the creative side, even though you know, look, my, my mom is a, is an interior designer and my uncle is a, um, a, an architect and, and my dad used to write and direct films in the Philippines. But even though they were artists, you could see that that being an artist, there's pockets of struggle throughout their career. There's moments where what you're eating is rice and, and banana with toyo. Right. And and those things kind of stick to you. Right. So so there's this. Uh, I, I again, this is just me speaking from personal experience, but I feel like like there's this ability in the Filipino culture to want to share our artistry, but the things that we bring along with us is our ability to kind of weather the storm and 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 the ability like like both literally and figuratively and and essentially it's 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 just this tenacity that I think we have that has um, carried us through generation after generation. Yeah, I think um, in the in the macro, going off of um, um, uh, what Francis is talking about, um, if you go into the, the big big macro, um, uh, we have over three hundred years of Spanish rule, and then over a hundred years of American rule, and in in there a, a few years of uh, of uh, uh, Japanese rule, and I think a lot of I think out of that what we grew was okay, the Spanish are here, so we got to follow the rules, okay. And then if you know a little bit of history of that, we then, our language started to get playful so that we could say things um, because they might understand some of the, the, the Tagalog or Ilocano and stuff, but we could play the words, you know, so that we could seem to sound like we're saying something and not, and then supposedly like the urban legend of Tinikling with the sticks, was was a way for the warriors to to practice with, without looking like they were practicing and stuff like that. Um, so what I'm talking about is yeah. that the Spanish were there. Let's let's try to survive, and because they're going to be gone soon. And and then the Americans got there, and then let's try to survive the new rules. And then then they were they were they were gone. And I think what we learned from that as a society that seeped into our our DNA is that. You know, politics, societal stuff, world pressures and stuff, that always comes and goes. But the only thing that remains are is, is family, is relationships, is us. And so um, I think we've got this unconscious thing of when big things happen, um, we take it in as it is. But then we kind of let it fly over us because the only thing that really is important is, you know, relationships in our family. And I think that's one one of the reasons why we're really so connected. And out of that, to go to your question, we we gained this innate ability to to adapt. You know, oversee. Oh, oh, you know, FWs all over the world. You know, you talk to them and they go like to Dubai or something, and then within a year they know the language, they know the flow, and they know how to work it. You know, we can do that anywhere and everywhere. And then for 100 years, we grew up with America, with English. And so all those generations, all those batches before us of Filipinos coming over here, it wasn't a matter of an Asian artist trying to learn American society and American entertainment. We were already used to that. We, we, we already inherently could get, you know, can figure that stuff out, even if we just got here um, to the US from the Philippines. Um, so that ability to adapt really, really 
really in, enhances our creative abilities because that's what create creativity is. It's about absorbing everything around you and then mashing it up and making it your own, you know, adapting it, you know? And, and so uh, that's just my pet theory. I, I think um, it is within us to, um, to do um, not just art, but just, just create creative living. You know, I, 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 I think, like Francis said, we're survivors. Yeah, I think, like, to piggyback off of uh, what Will said, just, just to add to it, one of the other things that, that's very common uh, in the Philippines, we, I think that one defining characteristic that, that I think a lot of Filipinos have is that often we're not working for ourselves. We're working for our family. We're working for our cousins. We're working for our uncles. We're working for our lolos and lolas and titas. And, in fact, there's there's a lot of people who work abroad to raise somebody else's family in order to bring money home to their family who don't, they don't get to see. Right. So I think um, there, there is this uh, aspect of the Filipino culture where when we fight, we're not fighting for ourselves. We're fighting for our family and our friends. And I think that um, that kind of uh, backing from family and friends, it, it makes you feel like you're standing on the shoulders of a pyramid of a family in France. And it, I think it makes that drive stronger because it's, it's almost like that Rocky moment, right? Where he's running and he's getting tired, but then all these people start running behind him and it's kind of egging him on. And I think there's, there's a lot of that in the Filipino culture where we're not running for ourselves. We're running for, for a lot of other people aside from ourselves. It's a super cheesy answer, but I think oh, makes that sense. everybody here has an aunt or an uncle or a tita or, 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 a, or a tito who you know don't, don't live with their family because they're working somewhere else to provide for their family. Mm -hmm. And that's a very common thing. And, you know, there's probably not a lot of other um, cultures and, and, and who have to experience that that kind of separation in order to better the, the situation that their family has uh, currently, you know. So it's, it's, it's just, it's embedded in you, I feel, you know. Gotcha. So from, from the outside kind of looking in, um, you know, I feel like there's the kind of the, the community within the community, right? So, you know, we're all fellow Filipinos and, and, and whatnot. Uh, what I want to know is, do you guys as Filipinos, do you guys kind of, I don't know if the congregates the word, but do you guys kind of give each other like tips and you guys check in with each other and, and do stuff like that? I think. Or if you try to at least. <laughs> Um, I think back in the days when conventions were were a thing, it was definitely it was kind of fun getting to see Willis and his family and, and Mike every now and then, even though we live in the same city. But it's I think there's just a sense of familiarity there, you know, where you are kind of probably assuming that there's common ground. Maybe there isn't, but hmm. I feel like more often than not, there's a lot of overlaps in in our personality and, and family and, and, and life. So there, there's a lot of um, exchange, not just in technique, but also just in in careers. Because I, I find that like, it's it's cool to exchange like, oh, Wills, what pen are you using? Or, or this or that, oh man, Mike, yo, what brush is that that you're using in Photoshop? And, oh, nothing, it's just a, a standard brush because I'm Mike and I'm so good. <laughs> you know? but, uh, but a lot of it tends to be like, like normal stuff because when you're doing this for a living, there's there's a lot of roadblocks that that occur in, in your career. And I and I find that that being able to to speak to somebody about um common experiences that and, and people with experience that, that have gone through it is it's definitely missed right now, I feel. You know, I don't know, I'm sure you guys are feeling that, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um when I talk to artists, it's mainly like therapy sessions. Um, just, yeah, like what Francis said, it's just find a common ground. And it's someone to talk to, cause not like, I mean, in the comic, outside of the comic world, not everyone understands like the grind and just the stuff that you go through as an artist. So you definitely have to have someone to bounce off of, just at least to talk or even crack some jokes and whatnot while you're drawing. Um, yeah, so I do agree with, with that. Yeah, um, you know, People have to remember that um, um, we all have our bat caves, and and it really is a cave. You know, we're still doing like 
you know, 12 hour days a lot of times, you know, um, it's very solitary. So we do use conventions to, to hook up, but I think, you know, to go, to go on a little bit of a track of what we were just talking about, um, even though we don't always see each other all the time, when we do see each other, those brief moments are a little more exaggerated or more, you know, more important because, you know, in, in our society, you know, like, you know, like when, when my family met Mike's family, you know, you know, we were just hanging out and then we walked around and stuff and had dinner and stuff. And my kids would then just automatically, you know, think of Mike as uncle, you know, or Kuya, or big brother, you know. And it, it's not me egging them on or anything. It's just natural now with them. And that extra personal touch like that, and we do a lot of that as Filipinos, when Filipinos meet even strangers, those little things make you connect even more. You know, and it's, and it's always unconscious. It's always un, un, unspoken. But, it's, but because of that, because of our culture, um, it, 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 it brings us together. So like, you know, you know, both Mike and Francis, you know, my wife calls them all, all of them, all of them, you know, after my generation calls them, you know, my, my wife calls them the boys, you know, and <laughs> she, she wants to baby them. She wants to mother them. She wants to, you know, take care of them. And that's just, again, natural to our society, you know, and, and, and it's natural to, you know, giving and it's natural to accepting. And, and I think that's one of the things, you know, to, to, to not go off too much, but I think that's one of the things societally as Filipinos makes us weather the pandemic a little better maybe than some people because, you know, we are connected to our, to our family, to our extended family, to then all our, our made up family, you know, like, you know, my kids calling Mike or Francis, you know, uncle and stuff like that, that when something like a pandemic hits, you know, I could, I could, I could message somebody in my big circle and I, I'm going to find a doctor. I'm going to find a nurse. I'm going to find a frontline. I'm going to find somebody that works for the government that can answer some of my, you know, my, 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 my fears. And so, you know, I'll, I'll be able to get some information and, and, and calm myself down somehow, you know, where if you don't have a big extended family where you just have your 20 best friends or stuff, what are the odds one of your 20 friends are, you know, a nurse or something, you know? And so you don't get that information. You don't get that comfort, you know? And, and, and so you live in the unknown of fear, you know? And I think that's one of the comforting things living in a F Filipino family, just that extendedness of a family. Like, like when my two kids who were raised here in the U.S., when they went to the Philippines for the first time when they were 12 and 14, and they met their 16, 16 cousins who were college age, and they spent like five full weeks of my little kids. My, my kids were bombarded by the fact that they had 16 cousins they never knew, and all of a sudden, in an instant, they were all just connected to the hip with each other. And that's just, that's just a part of um, uh, being Filipino. It's just in us. That's amazing to hear. That's amazing. I mean, I guess the bottom line is that 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 you know, being Filipino means family, right? Yeah. You know, no matter what, we're we're all going to kind of stick together. And that, that, that's that's so so refreshing to hear. Um, well, let's switch, switch gears for a second here. Uh, this question's from Mike. So, Mike, you know, I, I I've been I, I've seen your stuff, and it's it's amazing. Uh, it's almost painting like, and I see that you also work with digital. Is there is there do you do you have like a healthy balance between uh, traditional and digital, or do you do you prefer one or the other over the other? Um, uh, before it was a lot of it was I would say like eighty percent digital, and then recently I've been because of because of time, like uh, especially because of this whole COVID thing, um, work has kind of settled a bit, so like it's it's not on a crazy deadline mode. And I've been able to kind of dabble into the traditional stuff and I really loving it. Just the types of textures I'm getting, the types of brush strokes, like, you know, I'm using sponges right now and I can't get that properly um, digitally. So now I'm starting to kind of combine the two. And, uh, but I'm so used to digital. So most of the time I'll be doing it and I'm like, 
oh man, this is taking way too long or I'll make a mistake. I'm like, oh, I could just put this in Photoshop and just erase it. Your left hand like instinctively try to hit control Z. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And it's, um, you know, so it's hard. Like I, I do love finishing pieces. I do want to finish pieces, but I'm so used to the, or, or spoiled by digital that um, I tend to just after a while scan it in. If it's not working out, I'm like, I'm putting this in. It's going to look great. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, um, uh, with, with the spawn stuff I'm doing, I, I've done a couple, uh, a few pages in each issue traditionally, and I wanted to kind of delve into that because I don't want to do. I, I just feel it feels good to have something malleable sometimes. Hmm. So that's how I go about it. Gotcha. And and you know what? Uh, you know what I noticed about your work is that there's there's a very hip hop feel to it. it. I mean, did you start off like doing graffiti, anything like that? I uh, well, I, I was I was throughout my whole high school year, even from seven grade seven and all the way up to my college, I I pretty much all I was doing was uh, break dancing. So I was mm. b -boying. Um, that's literally just going to the basement, practicing, traveling to show, uh, traveling all over the place and like battling. So I immersed myself in the hip hop culture for for that whole time, and that's 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 really like my first love. I mean. That and comics together are are what is what makes me. So, yeah, for sure, that's a huge influence on on even in the comics today. That's such a Filipino answer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question is for Francis. Francis, you've worked for DC for almost 14 years, and you've seen everything from the New 52 to the current uh, Future State. What are your thoughts on DC constantly pushing the envelope and, and keeping their storylines fresh? Good question. Um, I'm only do uh, just to clarify. I'm only doing covers for future state stuff. Mm -hmm. so I have no clue. I have no clue. Oh wow! This. Um, uh, in terms of evolving, I mean, the th here's the thing: uh, with characters that you get from Marvel and DC, these are characters that are embedded in our in our culture. It's embedded in in the mythology that that we currently have so it is a bit difficult to retell the same stories over and over again so every now and then you do need to have these reboots that flip the script to try to make it interesting for new readers or current readers although that's a very divisive thing when you do something like that um but i i, I my opinion of it is that Let's be honest. A lot of the, these changes are driven from a, a corporate and financial standpoint, but the editorial team and, and, and the, from the top to bottom, if 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 they can come up with creative solutions that can accomplish certain corporate needs, that and then you know encapsulate it within a story driven. Um, I guess event or change. You know, here's the thing. Like when I worked on New Fifty Two, th there was really no story driven change for it happening. It kind of just happened because it, it needed to financially, right? Like that's that's the honest truth of it. But at the same time, uh, all of us creatives had this ability to recreate um, these tried and true characters and stick to the spirit of them and then also infuse who we are as part of the new canon of that book. Like, you know, I knew that obviously I can't change Barry Allen uh, into a Filipino character, but the, his very first major villain is a Filipino character, you know, and, and in fact, in, in those flash books, when he's hit by lightning, you know, his, um, the, the villain's mom is the one that visits Barry Allen and brings like over some, I, I don't know if it's adobo or curry curry. And I kind of just snuck all those things in there. Um, so it's, it's great from a creative standpoint, but it's also frustrating when there's no, um, when it's a rudderless ship, you know, everything has, if, if, if there's a, a creative direction that we're all kind of striving for, then it's, it's much easier for us to run towards that flagpole uh, but every now and then when you have these kind of massive changes, sometimes there is no flagpole planted and everyone's kind of just running all over the place, but that's a recipe for disaster to redo everything. Um, all of that to answer, I don't know what's going on in, in future state. I'm only doing covers. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually the first time 
uh, in, in my DC career that I have not renewed my contract and, and I'm actually freelancer right now because I'm focusing on creator own work. You know, it, it's, it, it's funny that when you said, Oh, 14 year career, I didn't even realize it was that long. I actually thought it was shorter than that. And, and when you said 14 years, it, it almost, um, reaffirms my my comfort in in going the freelance route because mm -hmm. you know, as much as i love dc i think i i stayed there uh, and and they're still kind of my 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 home i i feel but in terms of i, I think i stayed too long because it's it's comfortable and i needed to get myself out of that comfort zone and do the things that wills and 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 those other image guys have done you know like they were there's a reason why they're still around because they, they keep challenging and, and, and engaging on new ideas. And I think at, at DC, um, I've, I've gotten to draw and write everything. So at, at this point, do I stay and just keep doing the same thing over and over again? So it was kind of, so, so the state of the future is not future state. The state of the future is creator own books. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of future state, I know you're, you're, you're the closest to DC. Um, you know, we've seen Yara Floor as as Brazilian Wonder Woman. We've seen you know right. Chinese Superman, Chinese Batman, all that. You think, and, and you just mentioned, you know, the uh, Barry's one of Barry's new, you know, you know villains is Filipino. Like, do are, are we going to see? Do you think we'll see some Filipino uh, characters in DC? I mean, I I have no clue. I mean, it would mm. be great if we did because the way I wrote the villain, uh, so the the character's name is Mob Rule. Um, but the way I wrote him is by the end of the story, it was clear that he wasn't meant to forever remain a villain. He was on a hero's path. And that that is a story that I would like to come back to. And, and it's a character that I've yet to see return since I stopped writing The Flash. And I'd like to bring him back. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as, as, as a creator, um, so like... Spoiler alert, I have been playing a, a lot around with the idea of um, I ha every question I always get is where's Aquaman Earth 1, where's Aquaman Earth 1, and it stalled a lot because I started becoming uh, interested in creator own work, and for, for a while, so there's, there's Mob Rule, that's a Filipino character that I created, and I had toyed with the idea of making my iteration of Aquaman Filipino, but... I kind of go back and forth because sometimes I'm like, well, why, why do I want to give this thing to DC when I, when it could be for myself and create this, this new hero or this new story somewhere else. And, and it, and the thing is there's, I actually have no answer to this question. It's actually something that's ongoing in my mind because hmm. often I'm like, okay, well, DC is the biggest platform I could get. And if I create a Filipino character there, it would be amplified way more than if I did it on my own. But at the same time, if I did it on my own, would it have more meaning if I were to create this character who's Filipino that's in my own terms and, and have the ability to do whatever I want? Uh, I don't know the answer to that yet. So, you know, I mean, it sort of answers why there's delay on Aquaman Earth 1 is because I don't know which route I'm going to take, whether it's going to be mine or Aquaman Earth 1. Um, I feel like I probably shouldn't say that answer here, but but it happens all the time in comics where where people have ideas for for Superman or Batman or whatever, and then they're like, you know what this story is too personal. I'd rather take this and 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 bring it somewhere else and really go a hundred percent on it because if I were to do this as an Aquaman story or as a Superman story, this would only be me swinging fifty percent. But if I brought it somewhere else, maybe I can swing a hundred percent and really go off the deep end so to speak it's uh i don't have an answer to that question it's <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's a thought process still you know yeah there's so many so many moving pieces and i'm sure it's it's not easy for you <laughs> yeah well, i think it also has to do with uh you know a lot of the creative teams uh, on those dc books um a lot of the the different cultures that those characters are now being reimagined in are created by those uh, creators who are from from those places, you know. And um, I'll be honest, I'm I'm not familiar with with many uh, Filipino artists at, at DC right now. I'm I'm really unsure, mm -hmm. and and in some ways, I I don't know how many are in a position to write as well, which 
I feel like this question is making me want to go back to DC to write. <laughs> like, you know, this question's making me sweat, man. Let's move on. <laughs> Oh man, we'll we'll do that then. Uh, next question for Wills. Wills, um, I, you've worked on so many bo books over your your long illustrious career, and this is gonna, this is going to be asking like uh, like who's your favorite kid? So like who? What do you have any like favorite projects that you've worked on? Um, first, let me tell you, say the cop out answer. Um, all of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> And and that's um, that's actually there's a lot of truth to that because at the tail end of my ex um, years, um, um, uh, Jim and I had had it's it's ensconced ourselves so much in the office um, and with Bob Harris the editor um, that we were allowed freedom that was rarely given. Um, where we could do, what, we could almost literally do what we wanted to do, and, and drop in um, our influences. It, it is a different time to go with, like what Francis was was getting at. Um, back then, um, believe it or not, this is weird dichotomy here. There's this weird thing that um, back then, um, when I was doing Uncanny, we were selling about four hundred thousand copies um, a month. Okay, now. Today, on average, there's four books a month that go past 100,000, you know? So we were arguably making more money back then than we are today, but today everybody knows about superheroes. You know, my, my grandmother will bring me a comic book to sign for her friends. Whereas back in the day, we were like ignored because it's just kids stuff, you know? So my point there is the editors back then had a lot of power so if I powwowed with Bob Harris and said, hey, what about this? What about that? And Bob goes, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I was thinking about something like that. Can you add this? Okay, yeah, I could do that like this. How about that? And he goes, okay, cool. The next day I'm drawing that. You know, he had, the editors had that much power back then. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the, the two will agree that there's a big committee type atmosphere now in making decisions at, at both companies. And so it's it's harder to get something started and done, you know. Whereas before, you know, it it, it was it was real easy. So um, so a lot of the X Men stuff that we I did I, I really really liked. Um, of course, of course, to put it on a you know on a on a pinnacle outside of the obvious stuff like wet works and stone and stuff that obviously are are the top of my list like if you want to talk particular about the the x office of course it was um developing um creating a bishop with um with my buddy at the time Carl Alstetter um who's a toy artist right now um and those those storm covers um those were a big deal even for me back then being just you know just a, just an american kid you know um but see at the time people don't know this but at the time um the x office had gotten so big that bob had to let his assistant editors actually take um full reign on some of the books and so um suzanne gaffney was controlling my books and she was the one who came up to me and said hey you know um am i con convinced um, uh, the writers that do this story with Storm and Forge, um, and it's a trailer off of, you know, something that happened um, in the past. And so she wanted a soft cover, which was unheard of back then. I mean, all the covers, even to today, still are mostly, you know, big guns and fights, you know, slam bam, you know. And to do a cover, a white cover with Storm just kissing Forge or Storm just in the rain, you know, was unheard of. And I guess because it was unheard of, um, the response to it was really, really big. And um, that really sunk into me that um, that we could do something different. And, you know, going off of what both of them talking about, after a while, you want to experiment, go off into different directions. And so I started going off into different directions there into heavy drama and stuff. And I really liked that diving into the characters so there are no, there are a lot of times not huge like storylines but just little scenes sometimes and little things you know that i really like in, in in being able to push the envelope 
because you know in superhero you got to be superheroes you got to be you got to do you got to do it visually you know um and um i i my background before that was heavy you know data science fiction and um i was starting to find out we could do that and so when we broke off the image it was like oh cool no holds bar i could pour, put in whatever i wanted to put in and do anything that i wanted to um but it all started there you know uh, on uncanny yeah I, I i you know what it's it's so funny that you you mentioned that because i, I loved it so much i got it on a shirt so <laughs> I, I, you know what, I, those covers, the, you know, the storm, storm in the rain, and then storm in, in, you know, in Forge, so beautiful, you know, like there's so much emotion in just that one scene, and, and that's probably one of my, you know, aside from like, uh, God, Barry Windsor Smith covers, you know, <laughs> some some of my favorite, some of my favorite covers are from you. But, so. but you know, you know what's interesting for me is I, I'm I, I, I'm I'm really honored that I was able to do those covers and and get them out because to this day now. And, and and it wasn't in my mind back then. In my mind back then, it was just, oh, there's this cool relationship we could kind of hitch back to and maybe explore later on. And I could do these like iconic um, 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 covers instead of just a lot of action. But I'm really proud of the fact that I, I regularly have people coming up to me and saying, those covers were the covers that got them in. And, you know, they were LGBT issues. They were just you know, insecurity issues. There were, you know, believe it or not, when I was doing X-Men, I didn't, I didn't hook into that. I didn't hook into that, you know, the X-Men's represented the, the outcasts, the guys on the outside. And, and this was, you know, their story and them empowering themselves and fitting in. I didn't get that back then, you know? So having done those covers and then now I could get connected back like that because of those covers, you know, you know, I, I feel blessed. Amazing. I mean, we're so happy to have you, you know, <laughs> just, just with us right now. It's, it's amazing. Um, God, I hate, to, I hate to say it, guys, but we're, we're coming close on time. So I got a couple more <laughs> questions, and, and, and I definitely wanted to fit this one in here. Uh, by the time this airs, it's going to be the end of, uh, what's it called, uh, Women's History Month. Uh, do any of do any of the three of you know of any Panais or or just even in the broader sense? Do you know any of any women that are that are breaking through in the in the comic book community? Oh, that's that's a tough one. In, in the comic book community, in particular, or just in uh, in the art scene? Probably. In the, well, I mean, if we want to go broader, yeah, we can do the art scene too. Yeah, I mean, I think right now I've been actually following this also Filipino, but also Toronto artist. Uh, uh, Mika Sarina, um, she does all these like really cool um, digital paintings. And what's kind of neat is that um, when she does her paintings, there's a lot of um, very Filipino influenced uh, flavor to them. And actually, I think it would be cool to see her do comic book work. But but the arena that that she's in is more in the illustrative um, fine arts world. Um, so, so yeah, I mean that's that's off the top of my head. She's the the one that that stands out. Cool. What about the other the rest of you guys? Do you guys know anybody uh, that that are breaking into the field? Uh, or again, in a broader sense, uh, that, that are you know that that have caught your eye. I'll let Will go for this one. <laughs> um, well, there's you know like you know your audience might know of the Marvel character Wave. Mm -hmm. um, that's partly written now by Elisa Wong. Um, she actually uh, used to work at Bethesda as a writer. I actually met her there. Um, uh, she's doing a lot more comic work now um, and, and her own stuff. And um, I've just recently noticing um, uh, 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 Josie Trinidad. Um, um, she was on Rick at Ralph, you know, in Zootopia. You know, th there's there's a lot more women coming up, um, uh, mostly in, in in animation. But you know, like there's um, there's uh, Rian Gonzalez from the Philippines. Um, she's done Archie covers and some uh, Marvel covers. Um, she's a more traditional um, uh, watercolor style. Um, there's a, a a lot of them there. And then you know, here's a here's another Pinay. I mean. She's like the cosplay queen of Asia, you know, Elodia Gyoshin Fao. Oh, yeah. You know? 
Um, you know, she's just a gorgeous, you know, perfect DNA uh, 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 female with who who happens to come from a rich family. So when she does the GI Joe character and she needs Italian leather, she gets real Italian leather and gets it fitted to, to her. There's and, and now she's going into gaming, breaking off into gaming and stuff. Um, there's there's a lot that's happening right now. Um, there's a lot more that I have not been, you know, um, you know, been um, uh, exposed to, but 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 there's a lot more now, and I think it's apropos to go back to your question a little bit to one of your early questions a little bit. Um, one of the things that we we thought about consciously in image was that we always thought in three and five year cycles, like you know, we bring in cyber cybernaries and stuff. Um, because um, in uh, the uncanny days, because we were influenced by Appleseed and uh, Macross. And we thought, okay, in three to five years, the audience is going to want something new. So we're going to have to go look, consciously look for that. And that's actually one of the things that we actually did. And I think right now, with the world gobbling up, quote unquote, American superheroes, um, pretty, sure, pretty soon now, the world's going to wonder what superhero 2.0 is. You know, and um, I think that's going to be superheroes from different countries. And um, I wonder if you guys agree with this. Um, it's if they're going to be successful. My bet is if like a French superhero or let's say let's go to the heart here, you know, a Filipino superhero, if a su Filipino superhero like a Filipino Superman, if he doesn't act like an American Superman. If he acts like a Filipino Superman, and one of those ways is that, you know, he still has to visit visit his mom and dad every day. You know, he he can't hide away and say, "Hey, I, I, I'm all that now." To his, you know, his tropa, his his barcada, his gang. You know, he you know he 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 can't get away from that uncle that's trying to, you know, start a new business and he wants him to prop it up and sponsor it and stuff like. That. I think that's a really interesting thing to do a character with powers and he can help people, but then he's got all these connections, all these ties. And so to start the flow of those stories where, hey, I got, I'm trying to save the world, you know? I, I can't deal with all these little things. But then weave it into this journey where he, he figures out that, well, all those little things actually make who I am and, and they're much more important. And, and I think it's gonna be kind of, it'll be kind of cool if the world goes that way because then in those big business terms, then later on we could do, you know, French superheroes against Japanese superheroes and blah, 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 and, and just play on the differences, you know? And, and I think that'll be a lot, a lot of fun. So- well, I, I think that the, the yeah, what, what you touched on there is the, the sense of duty that uh, Filipinos have to their family. Um, that the sense of duty to family is is a universal feeling that really can transcend beyond culture and really it's a universal story that anybody can read but at the same time when you flavor it with something very personal and 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 specific then even it, it doesn't matter whether it's a filipino character or, or a german character uh, it will resonate because of those feelings are, are kind of um Universal, but just to dial back, I, I, another Filipino, uh, Filipina uh, slash Canadian, uh, specifically comic book artist that, that I know of is Emmanuel Emmanuel Chateauneuf. She does um, actually. I'll answer two questions for that. Is is one she does her own um, kind of web comic thing, and this if we dial back to your earlier question with how how we broke in and, and me saying that how we broke in is not really feasible these days. But what she's doing and what a lot of other people are doing is 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 the whole concept if you build it, they will come, right? So a lot of the 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 new artists that I think are are up and coming are not at Marvel and DC. They're and they're not at image. They're a lot of them aren't even published. They're setting up, up their own platform through social media or through web comics. And I think that she's one of those vanguards that are kind of making a place for themselves right and I, I think the way we broke in is that we saw a place and we wanted to go in right but now it almost feels like whether it's because of covid and because of the way things have, have changed those doors are a little bit closed but but one thing that artists these days have that we didn't have is the ability to use different platforms to 
forego publishers, forego editors and, and clients and kind of build it for ourselves. And rather than, than us trying to get in, they can come to us. And I think uh, Emmanuel is one of those artists who is, is building her own platform specifically in comic books um, uh, that are kind of in this new space of comic books that, that can kind of will probably be how it's going to be like moving on. So cool. Mike. Man, I'm lost when it comes to, like, I can't think of them. Like I'm, I'm already terrible with new artists in general. Like, um, I'm just like in my, like what Will says, we're all in our caves. So <laughs> I've, I've learned a lot about, uh, about all these new artists just from Wilson and Francis. I'm going to do my homework. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> all right, guys, we got one last question before we close this out. And then I want, I, I, I wanted to definitely throw this in here because it's uh, one of our couple buy-ins. It's a uh, Jerry Allen Gillen uh, passed away about a year ago. And I wanted to know if you guys have, have, have you guys worked with him in the past or, or if, even if, if you haven't, do you guys have any memories of him and, and what are some of your favorite works of him, uh, of his? I've been reading, uh, uh, the, his, his, his book, Elmer. Yeah. Doing, yeah. Um, to be honest, like, I don't know too much about, uh, about him, but I know the impact he's put in the, the industry. So I really went in and started delving into his work later on. And, um, that book I love just in, in general, like just the whole concept is it just, it's pure, it's pretty genius. So that's, that's my take on him. Yeah, I think like what Mike said, it's um, I'm, I'm mostly familiar with his Marvel work. Mm -hmm. And I think what's kind of been interesting about Jerry um, early on when, um, you know, social media platforms were really kind of just beginning, there was this website called DeviantArt. And I think a lot, it's, it's a place where a lot of artists congregated. And that's how I became super familiar with his work. Uh, because again, I was already a fan of his stuff at Marvel, but when when he started posting some of his personal work like Elmer, it was kind of cool to see somebody straddle the line between doing you know more corporate uh, mainstream stuff and then doing some stuff that's really personal. And I think what's kind of neat about Elmer is that you know uh, I I moved from from the Philippines when I was like nine or ten. so I, I have many fond memories of it, but but more or less the the bulk of my growing up uh, occurred here in Canada. So seeing his work kind of felt like, uh, like it, it kind of hit in a nostalgic way, you know, it's, it's almost like smelling a certain food or, or hearing a certain song that would kind of bring you back to the Philippines. So his work had this, this other level uh, that went from me admiring his, his intricate line work to to his work bringing me back to to something that is more uh towards my roots i guess um when i had a, a i had a studio in the philippines from 1995 to 2000 and there i was fortunate to 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 discover like lineal you jl anacleto um edgar tadeo gilbert monsanto um and, and and a lot of people and jerry was the one who, when I went back to the film in 19, 1995, believe it or not, I was, I needed a break from everything. Everything was just happening too fast. And I hadn't started my own life, you know, with, with, with a family or anything, you know. And uh, uh, so I went to the Philippines just to take that break. And I was introduced to Jerry, a young Jerry. And he's the one who convinced me to to actually stay, because I had no plans. Um, I, I was going to be there for maybe a month. Um, I ended up staying there for five years. And um, I had a conversation with Jer once um, at, at a store signing, uh, a Phil Bar store signing, and he was there. And he had some time with me. And so he told me that, he told me the importance of what I what, why I was there. Again, I was just there on vacation, just trying to break away, get away. And he said, Wills, you know, before you came, all of us, all of the indie guys were together trying to do this, but they had no hope that this could ever happen because the, the, the local publishing had, had just died out. Um, there was no work for them and there was no way they were connected to get connected to the US. I mean, this was the days of dial up still, you know? 
And so me coming there, not only me coming there and then actively then connecting them, but me coming there at the age I was and looking the way I looked, that I was a young Filipino who had already had a, a list of things I've done in comics and coming to the Philippines to take time to look at other people's work. He said that meant so much to the whole indie crowd there that there actually was now a chance for their dreams to happen, that it was possible. They looked at me as, you know, wow, if, if I could do it, then, then they could do it. You know, in, in the Philippines, there's, you know, there's a phrase, you know, um, kaya natin, that, you know, that we can do it. And um, that's what my coming there unconsciously, even though I was intending on it, that's that's what that's what myself coming there represented. And so I saw Jerry's work and I saw you guys. I don't know if you guys know this. Jerry's an architect by trade. He's an actual certified architect and he's built a couple of buildings. And so that's why his his backgrounds and his. Um, uh, uh, um, you, you could let you could you could you could soften up on your drawing of, of buildings and, and and spaceships and stuff and Jerry will take over you know because that that's his um that's his background as an architect he knows how things are built um but he was a writer too his first his first thing that he did which made him known to everybody was something called wasted and you know, I think this is uh, um, a thing that a, a lot of real good writers have. They're all emotional. They all can feel their feelings and express them. And so Wasted was about him losing a girlfriend that he really loved to a white guy. <laughs> and so it's Wasted because this meek Filipino guy then just goes berserk and starts going on a, you know, a, 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 a Scorsese rampage, killing people and stuff. Um, but underneath all the blood and guts, and there was a lot of it, it was all about all of the angst of being a Filipino and, 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 and being under that kind of society at that time. This was still the Marcos days. And um, he just put that all out there. And that's why he got noticed by Neil Gaiman and, and other top art um, writers right away because of that ability. So I brought him in, he became one of my artists, gave him some work. And since he loved the medium and was a, a great writer, he then became an art director for my studio. And then when I left, he became kind of like the Yoda character in my absence. And so when I came back 13 years later for the first time, um, it was Jerry, you know? It wasn't just Jerry, an, an uh, aspiring artist. It was Jerry. It was like basically Stan Lee. Jerry was basically Stan Lee back home. He he put up a, a comic museum. He 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 pushed a lot of the old artists' work. You know, his wife's father was a, a famous comic comic era comic artist, and he pushed everybody and he pushed everybody's work. He was a champion um, of. Of, of of all of the Filipino artists um, still back home. And so um, his passing hit a lot of people because he helped and encouraged and inspired so many people. Um, but he inspired them, you know, in everything that we're talking about here in the Filipino way of, you know, of just staying connected and staying, staying real with everybody. And, 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 and that's how he, enabled everybody's dreams, showing them that I'm just normal like you, just like me before. And and, and so you can too. So uh, it, it's a big loss, um, 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 uh, a big hole with, with him, but he, he left he left a big mark. He did. He did. You know, uh, from the outside, you know, as a fan, I, I know a lot of people knew him as the you know he had a he had a famous meme of him smiling you know that was his, that was everybody thinks that's me <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know it's it's crazy it's, you know like every time I would see that on social media I would say hey you know what he's he's more than that he's more than that he's a, he's a great artist you know like 
guys. And that that's why, like, even when I see him, like, I after he passed, I, I couldn't bring myself to use that meme anymore because I, I used it a lot before, but now I can't because, like, I, I know that he's more than that. So shout out to Jerry. Rest in peace. Um, you know, he's left a mark on a lot of us. So, But, but uh, you know, just real quickly, though, mm-hmm. that meme, that's something he – that was the other – that was the arts performance side of him, and he mm. really, really loved that. But even in that, in all his work and even in that, he was he was saying I'm Filipino. You know, I mean, you know, uh, both of the guys will agree that you, you you don't just write the cool hero. I mean, that's kind of boring, actually. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you want to you want your characters to have issues. You want your characters to be be human. You know, be f- f- um, faulty because that's what makes them interesting. Trying to overcome that, and, and Jerry that that his character there was him telling the Filipino community, the world, the, the, the creative community, you don't have to write pe- perfect people. Write about us. Write about who we are. So, so that's why he, he loved that meme and, and kept propping it up. Amazing. All right, guys, we're going to close this up. Uh, one last thing. One piece of advice from each of you for people who want to get into the business. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll go first. Um, well, first of all, I, I think I, I sort of answered this earlier in that stop worrying about getting into the business, kind of get into the business of you, get into your art, your stories. And I think, um, again, like all, all of the things, think of everything that was said here, even Will's talking about how flawed heroes are infinitely more interesting because seeing the the flaws and seeing them get over it, that's kind of where the interesting story is. And for for me, I believe that watching artists grow and develop either on social media or whatever platform it is that they're using, I think that that is a very, very powerful tool that artists these days can use. Because before I had to physically photocopy artwork and mail it, uh, nowadays, um, editors at Marvel or DC, if you develop enough of a following or create work that is meaningful and stand out, I, I really believe that using social media, the, the cream will always rise to the top, you know, and I think that artists these days should focus less on on trying to get in rather develop yourself and they will kind of find you. I know that this, that doesn't seem like a super super practical tip, but but believe me, I actually feel that that it can be because it's something that that we all have. If it's something that we all have, it's it's this, right? And and the connection. And I think it's that that global uh, connectivity that artists have these days will allow them to put their work in a bigger platform. So what you should just focus on is is improving as an artist, improving as a storyteller, and use the the platform that is available to you to amplify your art and make people aware that you exist and i think if you do that um you know the the whole field of dreams thing you know if if you build it i i believe they will come mike yeah um i agree with with uh francis i mean i never really thought about it like when i was trying to get a job i never thought about that like just invest in you and doing it that way and let the companies come to you. Um, that never came to mind. But now it's like, it is that time to really think about that because it will empower you and it'll allow you to do things that you want to do. And in the in, in the end of it all, I think all of us do want to get to that goal. And I think even for me, at I'm turning 40 and I told myself, I'm, I'm turning 40, I got to get onto doing things for myself. I don't, I don't want to be like 50 years old and I'd say all I did was like just hired work. Like I want to be able to put out my ideas, put out the things I want to do. And I also want to tell stories. So that's a great, uh, that's a great piece of advice that Francis said. I'm, I mean, I'm going to take it too. I, I recorded that just so that way. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted proof that I hung out with you guys. <laughs> um, uh, what I, I'd like to say what Francis said, but in a different way, uh, well, from a different point of view, um, as the guys will 
um, agree. Um, it's a different world now. You know, there was a time before where you could quote unquote make a mistake or make a perceived mistake. And, you know, you might maybe get the letters, you know, from the editors like a couple months later, maybe, you know, or here paraphrased it, you know, um, um, verbally. Um, uh, that's where conventions came in. We listened to the fans there. Now it's a different world where instantly you can get bombarded with praise, but equally bombarded with negativity. And so my point is, do what Francis says, get out there, put your stuff out there and, and, and put it out there so that you can get used to, used to that environment. Um, you have to have a thick skin here. You, you have to stay on course. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your art. And even if you're not there yet, you have to believe you're going to get there. And you can't let negativity and, and bashers um, get in your way because truth to tell, most of them are there not because they really don't like your stuff. They're just there to try to get, you know, views and stuff, you know, other reasons. So you, you got to learn how to, to, to not deal with, with that um, or to deal with that. And one of the best ways is to get your work out there. So not only can your work, like Francis says, get noticed, you know, but you can then start getting used to the audience. And the last thing I'll say there is my new definition of art is you have something in your head, a character, a story, a concept, and here, and getting it out is the art. Um, so if I'm thinking of something sad and I put it out here and everybody starts laughing, that's not, they're all screwed up. That's just me not communicating correctly what I'm, what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. And so that's my now definition of, of art, to have that idea, to be creative, to have that idea, but then can you communicate it? And so starting to put your stuff out, out on the internet and starting to deal with that starts letting you understand the audience and let you understand, not let you force you to cater to their whims, but if I have a strong idea that's happy or inspirational and I'm not communicating it correctly, that's my loss, you know? So I got to understand that audience in order to get what I want to happen in order for them to feel what I'm feeling. And the best way to do that is, is to put yourself out there. Um, because on the other side of that, um, and, and I get in trouble for this a lot, you know, if I was starting out right now and, and I found an indie publisher and, and, and I could um, get proof that uh, I go to the comic book store and see he's actually published some books, I'd even work for that guy for a dollar a page. Because like Francis says, eventually maybe somebody will see my work. And he'll find out that I'm, I'm getting paid a dollar page and he'll offer me a hundred. And then some Marvel editor then might see some of that work published and go, hey, here's 200. You know, you, if you're good enough and your work is out there, you'll, you'll, you'll get to where you're worth. But if you hide your work, saving it for that big break, you may never get that big break and the world may never know what you can offer. Yeah. Oh. To expand on what Will said, I I did that. I worked for free. And then when Marvel and DC came along, I had no idea what my rate was. So I made one up. I pretended <laughs> that the first thing wasn't free, you know. But I, I think I, I loved what Will said about uh, a true artists essentially taking your idea and, and, and putting it in front of people. And I think the, the, the biggest difference between how the three of us uh, started in the industry and now is – we were here. This is our idea. And then this is the output. This is the printed medium. And there's many, many steps along the way. And by the time you get to here, it might be three months. It might be a year, right? But but these days, as soon as I have an idea, the only thing stopping me from showing it to you is myself. And I could show it to you right here. The mo If I wanted to, if I had an idea right now and, and I drew it, I could present it to the entire world Sorry, my hands are sweaty. I, I'm working <laughs> like that, like a snap of a finger, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and I think that in terms of just practicalities of, of learning, one of the things that, that artists these days or, or any jobs, any jobs, one of the things that, that people have access to these days is, is information, right? What Will said, like I, I went to the library, that's how I got a lot of my early information. But these days you can literally watch Will. So you could watch Dave Finch, you could watch all these artists on their social media, on whether it's YouTube or Instagram, and you could learn how they draw. Those were things that were not accessible to us back then. So in theory, artists, artists these days could become crazier beasts than we were because they have access to way more information that we have. And then you, you couple that with the ability to eliminate all the steps between idea and final output. So, so to, to go back to, to re-answering the question is, is the only, the best advice that I think any artist these days should really have is just how determined are you and how hungry are you? You answer that question, you can accomplish any of those other things because everything else is accessible to you. So that's came off angry, but like it's, it's I'm passionate about it because it's, it's very, it's a very, very different playing field right now. And, and I can see how it is. And, and sometimes I have like these, weird cockamamie ideas where it's like, oh, I wonder what would happen if I if I created a brand new Instagram ac account just to see if this theory is true and just start drawing and see if anything happens out of it. I don't have time to do that. But but somebody should do it. I think it's I think it's it's a very, very viable option. And I see a lot of artists who are discovered that way. No, uh, you know, I I can see I can see somebody starting up a book of character characters going to conventions, get enough, save enough to get a table, and then start getting an audience and start doing little posters or little postcards and start getting a little more money there and then doing it all the time. And then after like a year or two, getting together with, 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 your, with your audience and then doing a Kickstarter for your book just for that audience, you know, one of the waste in, 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 in mainstream comics is we don't actually know how many people are going to buy it. So we always try to overprint but then it's perishable, so it's money lost. So I could see somebody doing that pay per print, you know, and and then after a couple of years and the audience grows a little bit, not hugely, but grows enough to, for them to be able to get a table at any con that they want to go to and sell stuff and grow their character, grow their stories, and then do a Patreon, you know, a, a Patreon where, where they pay you every month to do this stuff that they that are starting to love, you know, uh, uh, if if I was starting out now, I could see myself going to end days, you know, just with my own audience on Kickstarter and Patreon, because I'd be able to, like Francis was alluding to earlier, make all the decisions, follow my heart, follow my instincts, and just do what I feel is right for those characters and those stories. I think that's, I think that's cool. I, I would love to do that. You right, guys. guys started Image Comics. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Guys, I, I you know, I, I know we can keep on talking about, you know, just us being Filipinos and being in the industry at all, all you know, for, for another hour. But unfortunately, that's our time. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank my guest here, Mike Del Mondo, Francis Manipol, and of course, Will Spertasio. Uh, thank you again, WonderCon, for having us. And for more information, uh, on SIPA, please go to SIPAcares.org. That's S-I-P-A-C-A-R-E-S.org. Or follow us on all social uh, media platforms at SIPA Cares. My name is Quincy Victoria, and you can follow me at QV the Artist on Twitter, Instagram, and at Twitch. Um, and again, thank you guys. Uh, please enjoy the rest of WonderCon 2021. Thank you. Oh, is this an actual, like, uh, comic convention panel? Yeah. Yeah.